All right, folks, I think we'll get started. Uh, thank you for everyone's uh, being here, and uh, good afternoon. Um, our panel is going to be discussing uh, leveraging evidence-based electronic pathways to support high-value care. And we have uh, a group of us from CHOP and also from Penn Medicine that I'll be discussing. So what we're going to be talking about is, is in two parts, really, is, is the CHOP experience and what they've done. And they've been doing this for a lot longer than the Penn Medicine folks have been. Um, but Jane Lavelle, who's the Associate Chief and Medical Director of the Emergency Medicine Department and Medical Director of Office of Continuous Quality Improvement at the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia, will be starting off discussing how they started off with their Pathways program and, and uh, measuring success along the way. Next, uh, Joseph Zork, uh, who is Director of Information, Emergency Information Systems at the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia, will also be uh, talk, discussing the CHOP experience, experience more from implementing Pathways and Decision Support. We'll be transitioning then into the Penn Med Medicine experience, uh, trying to build a pathways program of our own. Craig Gumshot will be discussing, uh, he's a director for the Center for Evidence Based Practice, a medical director uh, at uh, Penn Medicine for clinical decision support. And he'll be talking, and then I'll be following up and finishing up with um, attempting to implement um, a pathway in new environments. Uh, and uh, I'm the assistant director at the Center for Evidence Based Practice too. So I'm going to hand it over to Jane now and Craig. Well, welcome everybody, and thanks for coming to our session. And I, I'd like to start by saying that it's an extremely exciting time to be in medicine right now because we have lots of opportunities to improve the outcomes of our patients in a very meaningful way. And we need to take on the IHI challenge of developing a healthcare system which is dynamic and which learns in real time to improve patient outcomes. Uh, so, you know, at the top bar you see is just a diagram of, you know, kind of our current state, which we are trying to improve. So we've got just uh, amazing amounts of science being produced um, daily, converted into evidence, but still some lost opportunities. We, as a frontline clinician, oftentimes don't get the evidence to the patient in front of us, or it's in, uh, applied to that patient in a very random way. And then we lose the opportunity of measuring those real-time outcomes of our patients. And so what we would like to do is harness, you know, the expertise of this group sitting here in informatics to bring uh, new knowledge and real-time knowledge to bedside clinicians and assist them to do the right thing. We have organizations now that are kind of interested in high-value care and accountable care, so are organizing themselves and ready to put an infrastructure into place to make this kind of thing happen. And finally, with the complexity of our patients currently, even in pediatrics, um, real high-value care requires collaboration amongst many clinical team members, and I think um, it's a combination of these things that can support that. So clinical standards work is one way that we can decrease variability in the way we uh, deliver care to patients, um, which is based on individual pro provider knowledge and experience. And by standardized care processes, we hope to get to the future state, which is var variation in care is um, demanded by the patient in front of us, but not the provider. And using tools of um, continuous quality improvement, um, we can build these standards, um, measure data, and change outcomes. So we become a group of, of clinicians caring together for patients in a shared setting in a similar way. So we started this work uh, about 10 years ago at CHOP, and you know, pathways aren't, are by and far not the only way to standardize care, but that's one that we came up with. And to define it for you, um, a pathway is a detailed plan of care that results from multidisciplinary work. Basically, every clinician or content expert that touches the patient, because those are the people with the fundamental knowledge with, who are best poised to come up with great solutions in um, that clinical process. It can be based on a disease, a patient sheet complaint, or a clinical process that kind of spans many places, like how do you lean a ventilator or clinical nutrition plans, et cetera kind of takes the evidence and the guidelines that are in the literature and in a meaningful way implements it into real-time bedside care using you know, changes in staffing and flow in pharmacy methods and clinical decision support to bring knowledge to the bedside. And additionally, I think it provides a mental model by which groups of clinicians will approach a clinical problem. And in doing so, um, kind of makes a, a foundation or a platform for effective communication because expectations 
are similar across different subspecialties. So how does he decide what to choose, like to work on, because there's so many things that we could improve on. So I'm sure all of you um, have come up with this kind of list. But I think initially when we started, we learned that our biggest successes came from choosing um, a clinical champion who was passionate about that clinical problem and was ready to be the boots on the ground to change bedside care. And uh, importantly, I think team leaders um, have to be people who are, you know, credible doctors who take care of patients, who are partnering with credible, ner credible nurses who are actively taking care of patients, who are going to lead a team that includes all of the um, all of the knowledge experts that touch the different facets of that care. And then we um, incorporated important content experts to help us, including um, trained improvement advisors, analysts and statisticians, informatics and cl clinical decision support experts, and then finally a web developer because um, we have published our pathways on the web. This is just a list of the basic steps that you go through when you're developing a pathway. It's an iterative process by which you uh, take the evidence and existing guidelines, you define goals, you have a whiteboard session to identify the major clinical decision nodes, and then through iterative, dis iterative discussion with the, your team, you come up with the final algorithm that represents the main decision nodes. And then to that, you, you give supplemental information about process management and stuff with the the clinicians meet at the bedside, you blend it into workflow using clinical decision support, and then you, you, know, you can't educate enough to the team about the new processes, put a data management system into place so you can measure um, your changes in practice, and then you have to maintain uh, improvement, um, and we try to update our pathways at a minimum of every two years. That process usually takes about four to six months. So here's an example of one of our clinical pathways. And um, you know, this is a hierarchical diagram which tries to give you a picture of the main decision nodes and taking care of a, pro a problem. And that's supported by hyperlinks, which are supplemental processes supporting this complex process to manage actually the complexity. You can see here there's a population which would include um, exclusion criteria, so who, which patients should this pathway be applied to. All these different care notes, this one is about sepsis, so certainly in sepsis this time frame is very important to pay attention to. Again, it provides a mental uh, model. We learned early on that by putting the team um, authors on the bottom uh, of the pathway gained a lot of credibility because people across the institution saw that the important experts were involved in the development, so they were more likely to use that. This is an example of a sub-process, so it just includes some details about how the nurses in triage might identify the patient at risk for sepsis. And so, you know, a lot of work goes into this, and I think that the experience of creating this organized uh, platform is good information that informs the clinical decision support which becomes useful at the point of care. So once we get the pathway and all the order sets, et cetera, into um, uh, development, we then decide what we're going to improve on. And so I will show you an example using quality improvement science, the PDSA cycle, on how we implemented pathways to improve care. So this is an example of the members of the Febrile UTI team. So Febrile occult UTI evaluating for uh, children for UTI is really a common problem in pediatrics. And so importantly, we've got all the stakeholders involved, right? We've got urology, nephrology, ID, general pediatrics, probably too many actually because they all have lots of opinions. And then we have our expert content over here, data analysts, clinical decision support web, et cetera. So we developed the pathway, we leveraged the AAP guidelines that were published in 2011 and uh, came up with our pathway which kind of said who should be screened for UTI, what is a positive UTI, uh, what's a positive UA, who should be empirically treated, how do you follow up, you know, uh, equivocal urine culture results, etc. And we educated the team and um, 
published the pathway. And then shortly after that, um, our, our, our data analyst helped us build a um, data set to look at what was going on with our team. So um, Jen, who just, I think, left the audience, built this nice table for us that looks at, you know, culture positivity. So this is all pulled from the DW, whether your culture is negative, positive, or critical, by whether you have a negative UA, a positive UA, or a critical UA. So you can see if you have a positive UA, your rate of culture, positivity, meaning, the defined criteria was, you know, four and a half percent, which is totally what is published in the literature. And if you had an equivocal or negative UA, your risk of having a positive culture was like 0.3%. So in conjunction with this, we then looked at what our catheterization rate was, because, you know, in febrile kids who are not potty trained, the standard way of obtaining the urine is actually by catheterization. So we looked at febrile kids who came to the ED and saw that we had a very high catheterization rate, which is 70%. And we're like, wow, is there a better way, since we have such a low positive rate, is there a better way to screen those children? So, important to come up with a, a catchy title, we decided to try screening using a bad urine specimen instead of catheterizing the patient. And so it was kind of a win-win situation because the nurses were extremely motivated to not catheterize patients. So one of our you know, wonderful clinical nurses devised a way on which, you know, a standardized way to apply that urine bag to the patient. And then we decided to, you know, we talked a while, came up with the process, and decided to try it in one team. So 12 beds out of our 70 bed emergency department get the kinks out before we would spread it across all. And so, and this is just an example of like all the steps of education. So it's pretty labor intensive, but um, very interesting and fun work actually. So here our, our um, data analyst and the prudent advisor then organized us into weekly huddles in which the team would come together and talk about which patients were seen, how were they screened, et cetera, and talk about the obstacles that came up with the care. So you can see here, um, Red represents the patient went straight to urinary catheterization, so the old way of doing things. Um, green is good, we did the bag first. And yellow was, you know, you got converted to um, catheterization because perhaps it was too long for you to wait for the urine, etc. So you can see we're going in the right direction over time and decreased our catheterization rate over, you know, a three month period. So this just represents those PDA cycles that we did over that four month period. The first one I told you was in, in a small area in the ED, which we noticed a dramatic reduction in, in, in the rate of catheterization. Um, and we continued to do more education. And you can see when we rolled it out, we had already had some you know, herd effect there was spreading throughout the ED, because again, the nurses, win-win situation, would rather place the bag and do the pass. And we spread it out then to the entire ED, and you can see over really a three-month period of time, we reduced our catheterization rate from 70 percent to, you know, between 25 and 27 percent, which has been sustained since we did that work a year ago. And to then, we went back and, and uh, changed the pathway, updated it with the new process. And, you know, just looking at patient outcomes, we, we did make sure that no one was having revisits for urinary tract infections that were missed potentially on the first visit. So in our healthcare system, we didn't see any missed UTIs. Now, I, you can't, if they went someplace else, that might have happened. Um, service outcomes are also important to look at. So length of stay for patients, whether they were capped or bagged, is the same. But we kind of have a long length of stay, so I don't, I don't really know if that's really great service. Um, I think we didn't really measure our nurse satisfaction, but uh, you know, they were very satisfied. And in fact, patients who were coming back for a febrile illness over time would say, I don't want that cap. I can wait as long as I, as I need to to get the, the um, urine in the bag. And then although we didn't directly measure, measure cost, you can see we, you know, once you catheterize a patient, all those specimens are then sent to the lab since it's an invasive procedure. So if the patient doesn't meet now screening, you know, a positive UA, then no culture is sent. Um, and so I think we can see we save some money in that. And then finally, which I think is really important and we probably don't do it enough, is to get the word out about the good work because it's really rewarding. 
and um, to celebrate those frontline clinicians that have given up their time to do this exciting work. So um, that is how Pathways were born, and now Joe, our, our, our CDS guy, is going to tell you how to hardwire some of the, this work into the bedside care. Yeah, so I'm our IT director in the ED, and i um, talking a little bit about um, how we implement pathways into our EMR. We've had a very gradual um, progression uh, into the EHR world and the CHOP ED, and it's paralleled very well our pathway program over the past 10 years, where we have almost 50 pathways now. Uh, with gradual introduction of computer order entry, RN uh, documenting, and finally the physicians documenting. And during that you know, gradual uh, imposition, we've, we've been able to work the pathways into each part of that workflow. And I think a key part of it is, is what Jane just talked about, is setting up the systems uh, so that first you think about uh, the people who are working on this, bringing them together to, to uh, discuss you know, what exactly they're doing and their unique um, individual take on, on how the process works. And then a really detailed uh, process analysis of what happens. And then only then do you think about whether there's a technology solution. And as Eric referred to in uh, the last implementation, the last presentation, a lot of times people come to us now with, uh, we need an alert for this. You know, so, uh, so taking a step back, sort of the clinical analogy there would be, I come to the front desk saying, I need an appendectomy. You know, maybe you don't today. <laughs> so, uh, so uh, really working through that process, and we really have that now, now in our ED, where we have we can assemble the groups to have the right people to. So we'll just talk about two examples of how we logistically implemented uh, decision support to, to support a pathway. So first one relates to our asthma pathway and uh, became apparent from looking at our, our data. We, we initially focused more on severe patients, but actually the majority of patients that we care for with asthma in the ED are mild to moderate. And looking at them, they, they were getting a lot of treatment. Uh, because we had focused on severe treatment, they were, a lot of these patients were getting an hour of continuous self uterine nebulizer when probably all they needed was uh, one or two doses of POPs by meter dose inhaler. Uh, and there's good literature out there, we did an evidence review showing that it reduces length of stay in the ED and also does reduce cost. So first we sat down, we had a great uh, interdisciplinary group of respiratory therapists, nurses, um, nurse practitioners uh, who do a lot of our asthma care in the ED as we have a, an asthma section of the ED that's run by nurse practitioners and physicians and work through the entire process. And then, uh, then only then we realized that we really needed to use our EMR for this. And this is a table from Jerry Osharov's book on clinical decision support, which is a great resource for this. I think it's important to think about all of the different ways that you can uh, introduce decision support. In this case, we were choosing an order set, but a lot of times uh, it's more effective if you work upstream. So if you're getting people to, to think about something before they're placing an order. Um, so in this case, our problem was we were over-treating the mild to moderate patients wanted to encourage use of meter dose inhaler. So our intervention was going to be an order set modification. And we uh, wanted to really explicitly recommend that based on the triage level. And, and that was a key part of this, I think, because the, rather than using an asthma score or, or another thing where someone would have to take an extra step to think about what the next uh, decision would be, we used the triage score, the emergency severity index, the ESI triage score, which is immediately available when you go see the and for the mild to moderate patients, we wanted to uh, give doses of puffs every 20 minutes times three. And then the other thing that we introduced was a kind of a win-win also with the respiratory therapists, uh, enabling them to make decisions. On the inpatient side of the hospital, they're like, enabled to decide if patients are improving and, and, and uh, withdraw care and make the, the treatments less frequent. So we were doing the same thing here in the emergency department. Uh, the respiratory therapists uh, had a role here where they could decide this patient is better, we can stop giving the treatments, uh, which also you know, encourages giving only a, the amount of treatment that we need. So this is our asthma pathway, uh, and we were focusing on the moderate patients, introducing that, uh, that conditional order uh, for respiratory therapists using meter dose inhaler. So then we went to the order set, and in general, when you're using order sets, uh, you know, there are a lot of benefits. They standardize care, they can save a lot of time if there are a lot of orders involved, and we found they can be a great teaching tool for residents. Uh, they are con there are concerns also. You have to know that an order set exists, and I think building into your EHR the suggestion or the, the, um, 
notification about what order sets are out there is a key part of, what, of our order set implementation because if the trainees or other folks don't know that there's an order set for something, they're not going to use it. There is a concern about automation bias where every residence can become dependent on order sets. So I think you want to build into that, and, and that's nicely provided our pathway, some of the why uh, and background behind it that there are, so they can learn uh, the reason for the care in addition to just doing the steps. So uh, the way we implement order sets in our AD is driven uh, largely by the uh, nurses' triage complaint, and we have a set of 70 triage complaints that our nurses have developed into a triage manual. So that enables us up front, all the respiratory patients in this case have one of seven order sets suggested, asthma, bronchiolitis, croup, influenza, et cetera. And when the clinician goes into order, they have that small set of order sets to look at and think about whether one covers the situation. Uh, we have instructions reminding people to use order sets, encouraging them, and, and in many places in our EHR, we put in instructions to help people who may not be very familiar with the system know what to do next. We have a suggested order set. And then in our documentation, uh, in the drop down list, we've introduced um, text that mirrors each step of the pathway. So it becomes very easy for the residents just to click on one step and saying, okay, this is a standard thing that I'm doing. I'm using the moderate asthma pathway. We're going to give MBI puffs. And since residents uh, and other trainees use, you know, they spend a lot of time in documentation, this helps to reinforce the points that we're trying to get across and kind of create a culture of, of uh, standardization. And this is our order set that we changed now. So uh, and you can see it's very explicit about what patients. So this is for moderate patients, ESI 3, with mild work of breathing, exactly what's going to happen. All of this is in the pathway, but reinforcing it within the order set so it's very clear exactly what population you're talking about and what's going to happen. And with one click, you can order the initial treatment and then two more treatments uh, based on the respiratory therapist assessment, and they can stop if the patient's improved. So what were the effects of this? Um, really pretty much on the day that we introduced it, this is a monthly chart, but the, the daily chart was fairly similar. Um, there was immediate change from about almost half of the patients receiving, mild to moderate patients receiving an hour of continuous albuterol down to about 14%. So a pretty dramatic change by just introducing the change in the order set after we rolled out the pathway, educated around it, uh, done a lot of background work. And in terms of outcomes, uh, we split this is graphing over time the percentage of patients discharged within three hours, which was our goal. Our goal was to increase this by 10%, and we saw that change fairly immediately associated with the change in, in uh, reduced intensity of treatment. And also, which wasn't really something we were expecting, but it's supported in the literature, we found that there was a reduction in our admission rate for asthma at the same time. And actually, it has been shown in studies that the, uh, using meter dose inhaler is probably maybe a more effective treatment. And also, there's kind of a framing bias issue that if you're treating a patient with very aggressive therapy, you may be considering them more sick. You may be handing off to the next team that, you know, well, we gave this patient an hour of continuous albuterol, maybe in that mind frame. So by reducing the intensity of treatment, we also reduce the admission rate uh, for asthma during this period and sense of sustain through to this fall. Some of the key issues, they have to be suggested and intuitively named. Uh, when you default or pre-check something in an order set, it can have a really powerful effect, so you want to think very carefully about that. For whatever reason, clinicians are reluctant to uncheck orders frequently. So really, much more than 90% of the time, uh, it, should be, it should be used not, more than 90% of the time in order to pre-check it in an order set. And when you can, by embedding panels within order sets, it allows further decision making so that by one click you can open up uh, further levels of decision making within the order set. You have to have very concise but also very explicit instructions, and you always want to test the order sets with multiple clinicians because frequently people are not interpreting it the way that you intended it. What if you want to discourage something? And, and this comes up. So, bronchiolitis is a condition in pediatrics where we're trying to, there's not, not a lot of evidence that uh, different treatments are effective. Uh, so this is what we call our do not order set. And, and the impulse, I think, is when you don't want someone to do it is to take it out of the order set so it makes it more difficult for them to order a chest x-ray or viral testing. Uh, and instead, what we found is by putting in the order set, putting the item in the order set but saying we're not recommending this, uh, it's a more powerful way of doing that. When we track the use of chest x-rays, in this case, over time, in discharge patients with bronchiolitis, the rate of chest x-rays went down by about 50% when we made the change in the order set to reinforce that uh, we're not recommending doing that. 
Then I'll talk briefly about an alert uh, and our sepsis pathway, and this is a common issue across medicine uh, that uh, patients with sepsis can be difficult to pick up. We, we have data from our own hospital showing that the patients who are treated on our sepsis pathway have improved timeliness of care and outcomes of care, but about one in five patients that we identified with sepsis within 24 hours, hours of coming through the ED had not been treated on our sepsis pathway. So although we had a really nice pathway in place to support all the multidisciplinary care that you need to give a patient that you suspect sepsis in, a lot of the patients weren't getting that. And the problem in pediatrics is that a lot of febrile children you know, could have sepsis, uh, so you have to think about it in a lot of patients and, and only introduce this uh, aggressive sepsis pathway for the patients that really need it. So you need an early kind of team recognition to avoid missing patients. So our problem here was that the patients treated on the sepsis pathway, they, they have improved timeliness of care and outcomes, but we were missing a lot of them. Uh, it's kind of a needle in the haystack problem. How do we pick up those patients uh, to, to know who to intervene on? And uh, so here's where you want to really think about, if you're going to introduce clinical decision support, what are the, what are the five rights? What information does what person need uh, in what format, uh, through what channel, at what time? You want to really think carefully about that. And so in this case, uh, in thinking about it with our multidisciplinary group, really the, the first person to intervene is typically the triage nurse. Uh, and they have their standard assessment, but in a patient where you're concerned about sepsis, in this case where they have tachycardia, documented a high heart rate, they need to do some additional assessments. They need to assess capillary refill, uh, perfusion, their mental status, and then think about whether the patient has a high risk condition. So ideally, we'd want that to be integrated in their triage assessment. So as they're doing their normal triage workflow, if they document a high heart rate, the, they, they would change what they're capturing. Uh, unfortunately, our EHR can't really support that at this point in time. Uh, so instead, the, the, the practical thing to do is to put an alert in. When would you want that alert? Um, the, the impulse would be, oh, as soon as they put the high heart rate in, you'd want them to get an alert. But actually, that's not the case when we got feedback from the nurses. So the last thing they want to do in the middle of inputting vital signs is get an alert that pops up and interrupts their workflow. So we actually delayed the alert to occur at the time that the nurse is assigning the triage role, because that's when they're doing the decision making to think about how sick this is. So even though we had the information earlier in the process, we delayed it to later on when was a more appropriate time to give that to the nurses. And in this case, we chose to use an interrupt alert. At first, the nurse just sees an alert. They provide the additional information. If that reaches a higher level of concern, then everybody sees the alert so that it's transparent to everyone that we have to do a sepsis huddle and decide whether to put this patient on the sepsis pathway. So how this works through, uh, in the end, we came up with a two-stage alert. The first one is based on vital signs firing at the end of triage with high heart rate or a low blood pressure, which turned out to be about 15% of patients. And then if the nurse documents a uh, delayed capillary refill uh, or a high-risk condition or altered mental status, then it escalates to a second level alert, uh, alerting the whole team that we have to do a, uh, a sepsis huddle on this patient. It's very explicit about where that should occur. If the patient's had a triage, they should be moved to a room. If there's not a room available, then the attending should come to triage. So it's very transparent to the whole team how we've decided this should happen. And uh, we ran this retrospectively on data before we implemented in the ED and determined that should only happen about 1% of the time. So it should be a manageable load a few times a day that we're going to need to huddle on a patient and decide whether to put them on the pathway. So this, when we implemented this, is what we actually saw of our monthly volume of emergency department patients that was true. Uh, about 15% um, of the patients had the base alert where the nurse added the additional information and only about 1% of the time were we having a team huddle. And when we track outcomes, this is the percentage of patients who are not treated on our ED sepsis pathway that went on to have sepsis. You can see when we first introduced the alert, it went down to a rate of about 5%, and then we modified it to make it a little more clear based on feedback. And we actually had a three-month period where we had no uh, patients missed on the sepsis, going on the sepsis pathway, so it turned out to be fairly effective. Just to summarize about implementation in the EHR, um, you want to first uh, as pathways are absolutely very helpful in improving emergency department care. I want to first really make sure you have a multidisciplinary approach and the right people to look at all steps of the workflow. Then you want to do a formal process analysis and flow of exactly what are all the steps. And then only uh, then do you introduce the technology. And a key part of it is having that web visualization or a, a common mental model where everyone on the team can see uh, you know, what the, the big picture is. 
then uh, carefully designing and testing your order sets, and then only bringing in alerts sparingly and, and targeted to the five R's so that you put them in at the right place in the workflow. Craig's up next. So we organized the, the order of this panel intentionally because a lot of the work that we're doing here at Penn was really informed by the CHOP experience. And I had the pleasure of uh, first learning about the CHOP Pathway program a number of years back when our, our group was asked to do a number of rapid reviews to inform their path, pathway development process. And we met Jane and Joe and Ron Karen and Kathy Shaw and others. Um, and as time has gone on, uh, the healthcare landscape has changed such that uh, pathways have become uh, more relevant for adult hospitals. I think they've, uh, traditionally, pathway programs have been uh, most common in pediatric hospitals. Oftentimes because people think of pathways as addressing uh, maybe one or two major presenting illnesses. Whereas adults, particularly sick adults in uh, high-level institutions, may come in with many different complications. But I think at Penn, we're seeing uh, a real need for pathways, uh, even with uh, complex adult care. And here are some of the institutional dr drivers for high-level evidence-based decision-making clinical pathways. Clearly, we have public reporting and paper performance on the left side here. That's encouraging our executives to think more and more about the quality and safety of healthcare that we deliver. And on the right, we have stagnant reimbursements, increasing costs of providing care, which causes our executives to think more and more about the value of every dollar that's spent on healthcare within our health care system. And that converges to support evidence-based practice, not just at the provider-patient level, but at the systems level. And in our institution, um, our Center for Evidence-Based Practice and the Office of the Chief Medical Officer for the Health System help support many of these activities around system-level evidence-based practice. Our center is within the Office of the Chief Medical Officer who reports to our CEO, and there are, there are many different departments and centers within the Office of the Chief Medical Officer, most of them uh, offices or centers or departments that are common to a uh, Chief Medical Officer's office, and we're one of those centers. And our mission is to support quality, safety, and value of patient care at Penn through evidence-based practice. And we do that in a number of different ways. We do rapid evidence reviews to inform clinical practice and policy. We do translation of evidence into practice through decision support, and more recently, clinical pathways. And we offer education and evidence-based decision-making to uh, training staff and faculty. What I'm really gonna focus on here is some of our efforts in clinical pathways. One of the first things that we did was we tried to understand um, uh, exactly uh, what the definition of clinical pathways was. And these are major bullets that come from a paper by Kinsman where they had to decide how they were going to define pathways as they reviewed the literature around pathways. And essentially uh, what's clear here is that there are five distinguishing elements. They're multidisciplinary. Um, they're used to translate guidelines or evidence into local structure. So there's an adaptation uh, process here. Uh, they're detailed. Uh, they're not generalized, but they offer details about the plan, often in the form of pathways or algorithms. They have time frames or criteria-based progression, and they aim to standardize care for a specific clinical problem. And when we looked at the literature around the effectiveness of pathways, we did find a Cochrane review that was published relatively recently. And it had a number of meta-analyses that uh, suggested that pathways could be efficacious. And this uh, meta-analysis here, we're looking at uh, in-hospital complications. And what it's suggesting is that uh, across these five RCTs that are being meta-analyzed, uh, pathways re reduce in-hospital complications uh, by about 40%. There are also some studies that suggest that pathways can increase the value of care, and, and Jane and Joe have some, shown some of that work at CHOP. These are a bit tough to read, but uh, these are examples of pathways versus usual care and how it affects length of stay in given conditions like stroke and pneumonia uh, and MI. And you can see reductions in length of stay in, in a number of these conditions. And this looks at uh, specifically uh, uh, patients on ventilators and ventilator days and how pathways can 
reduce the number of ventilator days for patients. And this is an example from a high impact guideline of what a helpful pathway looks like. So this is clearly about skin and soft tissue infections. And it helps the clinician think about skin infections with an abscess versus non-abscess, mild, moderate, severe, depending on the severity, what antibiotics, what other procedures might you consider. So it's a, it's a one case pathway of how to address this problem. So this has become particularly relevant for Penn over the last year as the institution has uh, acquired uh, other hospitals in the region and, and the footprint of the institution grows. And part of the opportunity that uh, was presented to some of these excellent uh, institutions like Chester County and Lancaster General was to be able to benefit from the expertise of Penn clinicians uh, and the experience of Penn clinicians in providing care to their patients. And so as part of making the Penn medicine experience more consistently excellent across all of the institutions that Penn's accountable for, it became more and more important to uh, create explicit standards, particularly for those conditions where patients are being referred to the Penn Health System for care. So that was some of the impetus over the last year to really get a formal pathway program up and running. So we were tasked with uh, building, uh, helping build a pathway program and then thinking about how to build a critical mass quickly. So we're really in our first year of a formal pathway program. And we looked at CHOP's experience over 10 years of developing a program and we thought to ourselves, how can we take all the great stuff that they've done and accelerate the process at Penn where we could catch up just a bit. And so we've taken an approach here that I'm, I'm very interested in hearing your feedback, but of trying to get a critical mass of pathways all on one site that people know they can go to to find helpful information. And in order to create a critical mass, we have the ANOVO pathways that we've started developing with key stakeholders. Uh, these are pathways that our center develops uh, in conjunction with the Office of the CMO partners that we have. Then we also have commonly used pathways across our entire health system that were locally developed. Many of these pathways are pathways that our center was involved in in previous years, but there wasn't a formal program to develop these pathways. And then we also have pathways that are commonly used by groups across our health system that are from national or international peer review sources. So what we've decided to do is take all of these types of pathways and put them on one page so that we have an initial critical mass that will lead people to our site. And so at this point, we have about 25 pathways of this nature on a single page that people can uh, download and use in clinical practice, the minority of which are de novo pathways that, that we've created. That said, I do want to give an example of one de novo pathway that we've created over the last six months. And this was a pathway about uh, treating patients uh, who uh, present to the emergency department with massive hemoptysis. Clearly, this can occur in the case of uh, patients with cystic fibrosis or lung cancer or lung infection. And we've had a number of cases uh, over the last number of years where there's been some confusion about how to manage these patients between different services. And there was a request from, as Jane was describing, a very engaged clinical leader in interventional radiology about putting some guidance together that not only interventional radiology could use, but other stakeholders such as uh, pulmonary, intensivist, thoracic surgery across all of our entities. So we got this group um, together and the first thing that we wanted to do before the initial meeting was perform a rapid review to identify existing pathways or algorithms. And we realized uh, by quickly looking at the literature that there wasn't one approach to quickly find algorithms or pathways that already existed. And we wanted to be able to do that quickly to make our process more efficient. So we searched for guidelines and reviews in National Guideline Clearinghouse, Cochrane, Medline, and Bates Synop. We also searched for algorithms in Google and evidence resources like UpToDate, Dynamed, Clinical Key, Access Medicine, Society websites. And then we used a unique formulation of search terms to balance our search so that it was uh, optimized between sensitivity and specificity. And let me give you an example here. So here's a search strategy that we used for massive homophysis. And what you see here is that we're combining all of these terms like critical pathways, clinical pathways, care plans, patient care algorithms, nursing protocols, professional standards, 
all in uh, one search, so that we have about 300,000 hits. And then we combine uh, the terms that are relevant to our clinical question at hand. And in this case, it's natural thermography, it says 13,000 hits. And then when we combine these, uh, these uh, study design type terms with our clinical terms, we get about 100 hits that we can quickly look through to identify existing algorithms or pathways. And so what we did after that search, we found a number of pathways that were potentially relevant. We built a straw man pathway, and we shared it with our key stakeholders, as Jane was describing, in an initial in-person meeting, so that people could give feedback, we could iterate. And then uh, something else that we did was uh, we uh, decided to use a software tool uh, to iterate and asynchronously refine the pathway after that first in-person in, uh, meeting so that we could accelerate this process and not delay the development of pathways by all of the challenges that come along with trying to schedule uh, 10 really busy people to get together multiple times. Uh, so we used software called Dorsada to create the Strawman pathway. And after the initial in-person meeting, uh, the pathway that arrived from that initial meeting was sent out to all the stakeholders, and then they had an opportunity to comment on how they might change the pathway further. And then we could perform additional focus rapid reviews if critical questions arose about particular decision nodes. And in the case of massive thermophysis, we ended up doing that for two particular areas. And this is the pathway that uh, ended up being developed. This is in the Dorsada software. And we posted this pathway uh, to our site uh, that includes many pathways. And it's now in use mostly by our interventional radiology and pulmonary fellows who are all well aware of this pathway after being in service. So I'm going to pass it down to Nikhil, who's going to give a further example and talk a bit more about dissemination of pathways more broadly. So uh, as Craig mentioned, I'm going to talk a little bit more about uh, another example we use, and then really talking about dissemination. Uh, I'm going to try and leave the last five minutes for questions for the entire panel. Um, so hold questions until then. So I might go a little fast through this to get everyone out of here for the next lecture. Um, so the example I'm going to bring up is CAUTI, so Catheter Associated UTIs. And, the and this was another example that came from a really engaged clinical leader. Our uh, director of infection control basically came to, the, to our uh, uh, set meeting and basically said, we need to fix this. And this was basically uh, the CAUTI rates that were basically exceeding our high performance target. And CAUTIs were becoming part of the hospital-based value purchasing plan for CMS, and basically people were gonna get imposed a penalty uh, for CAUTI rates exceeding uh, their peer institution. Uh, how we went about constructing uh, a CAUTI pathway was really based on what we did with Thermopsis. We really searched the evidence and really found uh, some guidelines that we could quickly adapt to. Uh, so the major guidelines are very familiar for a lot of you, I'm sure. Um, and then we basically turned that into leveraging our center for evidence-based practice to develop our own rapid reviews. So using these guidelines to answer a few specific questions that we thought would probably come up. So commonly one, common ones we used were uh, sequencing of urine analysis and urine culture. Uh, in catheterized patients, so whether or not it was even helpful to send a urine analysis in someone with a Foley catheter because they often turned up positive. And then also, uh, take when to collect the specimen. Do you change the Foley every time? Do you have to take it? Do you have to change it every time? Do you have to change it after a certain number of days, a certain number of hours? Does it depend on the type of patient? Does it depend on the type of unit? And part of the reason for this was also because we had widely varied practices, not only from each of the different entities, but within each entity, every unit had a different practice. And they were in service, and the nurses were in service on uh, the different practices. But our house staff that were rotating through each unit were basically being told a different system every two weeks or every time they were rotating through. So it's very confusing. So this is our prototype, um, and this was basically the first in, 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 um, in person meeting. We had a group of us from uh, multiple, di multiple disciplines, but we basically went straight for the post its with different colors, and we thought this was the best approach. It's probably not readable. There's some, you know, there's there's some arrows that go around here, but basically you can get a trend that there's a start and there's an end, and somehow it flows through. The different colors we correlated the different kind of actions that certain people might need to take: uh, diagnostics versus intervention versus uh, following up on test results. 
But this is how we developed our prototype, similar to what Joe showed with the whiteboard and the asthma pathway. Again, we had this multidisciplinary group of stakeholders. This, kind of, this is uh, quite large for multiple reasons. First of all, we were trying to be very specific. We were trying to be inclusive to our downtown hospitals. So that would include three main hospitals downtown. So we wanted input from all the hospital systems. We wanted to make sure infectious disease was well represented. Our critical care team, who were really already had started to do pathways for uh, catheter-associated UTIs, making sure nursing was involved very early on. Um, and that we obviously needed uh, help from leadership um, and quality and then informatics to help us along the way. So this is what we ended up with with our diagnostic algorithm. It, it again was made in this Dorsata software, and I'm actually going to go through in the next couple slides about the Dorsata software um, and what it looks like. But um, again, it has this, you know, common features are starting and yes, no logic that was part of our, when we defined uh, pathways, yes, no logic that was really just progression. So how we basically started to disseminate this, and this is, this is uh, sort of the challenges and, and the successes that we faced in our short time. Um, we have an intranet site um, where people could uh, sort of uh, Google search very easily. So Pathways was the first search. For, for, typing in Pathways would generate the first hit, which would brought, bring them to our website, the Center for Evidence Based Practice, and within that we had a Pathways um, link. You, they would retrieve this list of pathways organized by date, but also could be sorted by uh, title, and it also had a search function within it. So recognizing that a lot of our users were also used to Google searching, and that was the way we had to sort of frame their mind too, and trying to develop a site uh, that would match those uh, common practices. So a little bit about Dorsada. This is a software company that, um, and I'll use the Google Maps analogy in this, of how, how we went from AAA picking up a map to how Google Maps has transformed the way we use car traffic and we, we make road trips now, right? So Dorsada basically was the software we described where you can not only build, but you can disseminate pathways as well. The hope is that this uh, website that um, is basically a list is going to be replaced by something that looks like this. Uh, again, searchable with multiple car decks, showing you the authors, uh, as well as being able to make favorites, being able to browse, um, and having different features within it itself. Uh, we've started to begin, do people even use this, these websites? So we have two uh, pages that are, are, are intranet sites. They are basically capturing the same page, but for whatever reason, the URLs are actually different. Uh, one is uh, pathway slash index, the other is just a pathway site. Uh, it's very difficult to make a this usage data to date um, because it's been a short amount of time and we haven't actually done a formal launch of the pathway site. We really just used word of mouth so far. But it shows us that we've, we've gone up and, and having chopped experience of how do you even know people are going to be using this and how, do, how can you measure whether people are not. Um, ultimately, Dorsada on their back end actually has the ability to track the user that's logging in uh, and track their usage through each pathway, how long they've been on the pathway, how are they using the pathway, how frequently what new users are potentially uh, using the pathway. So it helps us, leveraging these private industry uh, software companies helps, helps us on our front end, making sure that we're, we're tracking who's using it. Uh, we also hope that Dorsada will eventually be something that we can use at the point of order entry. So similar to uh, what the CHOP folks have done, of how do you integrate pathways into uh, actually the actual care of the patient. So there's actually step by step you can traverse down a pathway uh, with yes and no, so that you could imagine that a bedside nurse who has the computer inside the patient's room could traverse this to help make her decisions as well. Also thinking about the Google Maps analogy, it's really great to have Google Maps uh, print out the map and then follow it along, but it's really even nicer to think about how are you doing it on the fly. Uh, and, and so they're actually, they're not actually like a mobile app that will um, quickly allow you to use the same traversal that you had in this prior experience, but at the point of care. We imagine that this will probably be used more by um, providers who are placing orders that don't have access to a computer immediately or trans going from patient to patient um, between uh, trying to make decisions on the fly. And the, uh, the point I didn't mention about the uh, point of consumption part is actually this, this panel here is where an author, like me, who you saw uh, on the author and the owner page, actually has the ability to place review items in here. 
So on the back end of Dorsada, they actually have the ability where Craig was talking about the massive homophysis pathway. This would actually show up for people who we term reviewers, so the content experts to actually go in and add in uh, comments about what they think. So this is the asynchronous part. So it's, it's all in one tool in the sense that the, the user, the reviewer, the author, and the publishers all have access to the same tool, but different viewpoints of it. And then ultimately trying to get this into an order set. And, and I don't want to spend a whole lot of time on this um, and leave some time for questions, but ultimately how do we get this CAUDI order, how do we get this CAUDI pathway to be implemented in some way? Talking about the things that we would ideally like in a order set that would uh, implement the pathway. And having it look something like this. It's not as fancy or nice as the epic looking ones that I think the chop folks showed you, but basically the same principles. Uh, information that can be easily retrieved from the American electronic medical record can be um, brought pulled in, and then default set up for, for helping providers make the best choices in their circumstances. And uh, being able to review the pathway within uh, the order set as well. So that it would actually, clicking this link box would actually link you to the actual order set in a separate URL browser page. So I'm going to leave that for discussion and questions. And I know I sort of went through that very quickly. But um, if anyone has questions. I sort of feel like uh, I feel like uh, we're we're definitely on the same page with that. Um, a number of the pathways that are being on being posted on our site um, uh, currently are pathways that are longitudinal pathways. They're pathways by our oncology colleagues, our cardiovascular colleagues, about uh, what a, uh, a longitudinal care plan looks like for a given indication particularly for patients being referred into the health system for specialty care. So I think particularly for those types of pathways, I think you're 100% uh, on track. And I think as we get, we just recently signed the contract with Dor Dorsada, so as we get the website up and running and, and replacing the UPHS intranight site that we currently have, as we're able to track how people use both the website and the mobile app, I think we'll be able to learn a lot more about how people consume this, uh, and that'll help us uh, integrate uh, into into the electronic health record in the future, particularly as as we go up on inpatient epic. We should start talking to them now. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, I agree too. Um, and I think there are creative ways you can do this. Eric showed a nice example on the last session of the febrile neonate. So midway through the hospitalization, an alert coming up saying, you're at this point, maybe we could send the patient home. <laughs> uh, and that's interruptive. It's probably not ideal, but I think that type of, uh, okay, but that's of workload. that's a single node. Uh -huh. so what we've done for the most part in CDS is single node. You know, mm -hmm. We're sort of alerting you, mm -hmm. this is a node, and you don't really know anything about the rest of the pathway, but I'm just telling you, here's what's going on here. But the clinician would like to know the whole length and breadth, and we don't as yet have the, the functionality I think, yeah, ways to visualize that while you're in your workflow would be really ideal. And uh, definitely, I, I'm giving that feedback to them. Uh, it's easier in the ER setting because we, we're kind of a single node kind of environment. <laughs> but uh, uh, in the sense of patient comes in with usually chief complaint and, and you can carry it and out, you know, works well with algorithms. But, but for more complex things, I think that's what you need. I also think uh, Eric brought up this issue earlier of uh, laying wire and pipe versus optimization. And I was sharing with Eric earlier, I felt like we had a number of really good years, particularly on the inpatient service, where we had the time for optimization. And I think we've gone back into the laying wire and pipe, but I think that, as you were saying, JT, at some point soon we'll be able to work on optimization again. And uh, I think preparing for, for that work as soon as we can is a really good idea. Um, hi, I'm Susan Arthur Shrigley from Washington University of Pennsylvania. Um, I'm a human factors and I might be using this tool, so Craig told me to come to this session. <laughs> <laughs> um, I really enjoyed seeing how far along this work has come. It, it, it seems like it's really um, uh, hitting its stride and we're able to, to see the outcomes from it, especially in the work that Chuck has done. Your picture, uh, I think it's Joseph? Joe. Mm -hmm. yep. Joe, um, <clears throat> of the figuring things out with the clinical people and then coming to IT for the solution. I think JT's question sort of hits on this as well. I actually, one of the things I try to do is bring the IT folks and the clinical folks together with us, the um, innovation IT folks, um, very early in the process so that the, we can develop not just what should be done, but push the edges of how it can be done. Um, and I think linking this to um, Jason Moore talked this morning about AI in healthcare, linking it to some of our data science work um, in predictive analytics. I think I'd like to see this work think towards um, going uh, towards using automation to do things like maybe tracking the person, tracking the patient through a pathway or figuring out a way that the end um, result isn't always a person getting an alert or opening up an order set to sort of um, open up that IT space to see what kinds of more um, advanced things we can do. Um, so I guess it's not really a question, but I would enjoy hearing any of your thoughts about direction for future research in this area. Yeah, I agree. I, you know, uh, I, I'm and in talking about it with the vendor, I'm on one of the, Epic has these steering boards for, uh, for different specialties and I'm on ours there. So that's what we've been talking about is that, you know, when you come in, you know, it should be, what you see should be adapting to the current situation of the patient. So you might have a different view based on, you know, where you are in the workflow and where the, where the patient is in their, you know, needs. So that having the system sense and adapt you know, so that you're not being overwhelmed with information. I think the tendency is to put as much as possible onto the screen because we can't really tailor it, you know, but having the, the system tailor that so you're getting less information but more, you know, important information for that point in time is, is where we need to be. I think, I think one other thing to consider, and we've talked about a bit we talked about this a bit with, with leadership at, at our institution, is so much of the work we're doing in Pathways, uh, although it has great potential, it's foundational work and is, is forming a foundation for that great potential. And at some level, we're really putting blueprints on the page that were never documented before. Mm -hmm. You know, very good clinicians may have known this. Um, departments or single units within a larger his 
health system may have been doing this well, running like well-oiled machines, but as an institution, we didn't have this documented and we weren't sharing this, uh, particularly with our, our analogous co colleagues at other sites. So a lot of this work is just uh, hard work, foundational work, developing blueprints that then we can, we can work off of in, in later years. Thank you, everyone.